we're going to give it a couple of seconds, everyone, for uh, for people to come in, and then we're going to get started. Okay, so we're gonna get started. I think uh, people are gonna trickle in, but that's okay. I'm gonna start with the um, the intro to our event. Welcome everyone. Um, uh, this is a new seminar in our criminal justice uh, speaker series hosted by the Criminal Justice Coalition at the Shuli School of Law at Dalhousie University. Uh, I am Adelina Iktene. I'm a criminal law professor here at the law school. Uh, and I'm gonna be the host for today's event. Uh, today we have with us uh, Mr. Pat McEwen, who is a trial um, lawyer here in uh, in uh, Halifax and a graduate of Shulik Law, is that true? True. Yes, there we go. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, and uh, he is now practicing at McEwen, Meg, Geigen and Giacomo Antonio. Uh, Mr. McEwan is going to uh, take us into the world of undercover operations and into the challenges of defending somebody who has confessed to a crime during a Mr. Big sting. Um, now you're going to get an overview of what those undercover operations are during, uh, during the talk. Um, I will just note uh, for those of you who don't know that until 2014, the confessions obtained through a Mr. Big uh, undercover operations were automatically admitted at trial uh, because there was no re uh, regulation, uh, uh, no, no legislation regulating uh, their admission um, at the time. Now in 2014, the Supreme Court of Canada created what we now call the Hart Framework, uh, which basically uh, says that the, uh, the Mr. Big obtained confessions are uh, considered generally inadmissible unless the Crown can prove that they are reliable and they haven't been obtained through abuse of process by the police. Um, now, since 2014, uh, the Hart framework has actually been uh, used quite a bit. It has been used in over 60 cases. Um, and uh, a study that I've conducted with my former student, Vanessa, uh, Kinnear shows that uh, basically the confessions were admitted in the vast majority of cases. The confessions were excluded only in five cases. Um, so the impact of heart was negligible in this area of law. However, the uh, interesting thing is that uh, in two out of the five cases in which the uh, confessions were, uh, were excluded, and as a result, the accused was uh, acquitted, uh, Mr. McEwan was the lawyer. So Mr. Um, McEwan has uh, quite a bit of uh, experience with uh, Mr. Big operations uh, and uh, defending the target. So we are very lucky to uh, have him here with us tonight. Um, before I provide an, an, um, uh, uh, an introduction to Mr. McEwan, I just want to note that um, you have at the bottom of the screen, you have a, a Q and A box and uh, I would like to invite you to use it to ask questions there, and I can fill them and ask them to Mr. McEwen at the end of the talk. Um, now, Pat was called uh, to the Nova Scotia in 20, 2004. So again, after graduating from Schulich Law, um, his focus is on criminal defense, criminal code, controlled drugs and substances act, and regulatory offenses. Pat has practiced all facets of criminal law and has been involved in a number of high profile cases in Nova Scotia, including numerous murder trials. Uh, he has also presented at a variety of criminal law conferences. Um, he's a member of the Nova Scotia Criminal Lawyers Association, and he has appeared in all levels of courts in Nova Scotia, as well as provincial courts in New Brunswick and Newfoundland. Uh, with that, I am going to uh, turn that to you, Pat. Welcome and thank you so much again for being here. Thank you. Okay, um, so yes, as Adelina has uh, indicated, 
I am uh, here to speak on the use of uh, the Mr. Big undercover technique in uh, criminal uh, matters, uh, and in particular, defending individuals who have uh, confessed to an offense uh, after being the subject of a Mr. Big investigation. I have had an opportunity, as she has mentioned, uh, to represent uh, a number of individuals uh, who have been the target of undercover investigations, and one in particular that I will speak about in some detail, uh, who was subject to a lengthy Mr. Big operation. Um, Adelina has uh, outlined fairly clearly uh, what a Mr. Big operation is, uh, but despite that, there seems to be some confusion with respect to the definition of what a Mr. Big is or what the Mr. Big technique is. And as we will discuss a little bit later, later on, uh, the definition does matter. So uh, as mentioned, the Supreme Court of Canada addressed uh, these types of operations in its 2014 decision in the Queen versus Hart. It defined a Mr. Big operation as follows, and I will quote, a Mr. Big operation begins with undercover officers luring their suspect into a fictitious criminal organization of their own making. Over the next several weeks or months, the suspect is befriended by the undercover officers. He has shown that working with the organization provides a pathway to financial rewards and close friendships. There is only one catch. The crime boss, known as Mr. Big, must approve the suspect's membership in the criminal organization. The operation culminates with an interview-like meeting between the suspect and Mr. Big. During the interview, Mr. Big brings up the crime police are investigating and questions the suspect about it. Denials of guilt are dismissed and Mr. Big presses the suspect for a confession. As Mr. Big's questioning continues, it becomes clear to the suspect that the, by confessing to the crime, the big prize acceptance into the organization awaits. If the suspect does confess, the fiction soon unravels and the suspect is arrested and charged. So that's the definition uh, of a Mr. Big operation, which is outlined at the beginning of the Hart decision. And that's a majority decision written by Justice Muldaver. And as a defense lawyer, um, an operation of this nature does cause a fairly significant amount of concern and creates several challenges. And in particular, if your client uh, indicates that they have confessed to an offense that they did not in fact commit. So as previously mentioned prior to the Hart decision, there was really very little as far as uh, constraints on the police and how they were to operate in these uh, undercover operations. It was designed in, in a, such a way that it made it very, very difficult to challenge the operation itself or the evidence that was uh, obtained through the use of a Mr. Big investigation. Um, lawyers tried in many ways to object to the admissibility of evidence uh, that was obtained through Mr. Big confessions. Uh, and for the most part, I think, but for one, uh, they were unsuccessful. Um, the reason for that is that the standard ways in which lawyers would generally challenge these confessions or challenge confessions to police officers um, did not apply. So for instance, the principle of voluntariness uh, did not apply uh, as the police officers uh, were not objectively police officers. They were posing as criminals and as such did not appear to be persons in authority. Uh, therefore, the confessions rule did not apply. Uh, with respect to uh, challenges under the uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, the individuals were not detained by the police and as such uh, were not entitled to be advised of the right to silence. They are not entitled to be advised of their right against self-incrimination. So there was certainly a void um, with respect to uh, a way in which to attack uh, these operations. Therefore, in 2014, um, there was very little to prevent the police from using these uh, techniques or up to 2014. And for the most part, they used them as often as they could because frankly, they, they had quite a bit of success. <clears throat> there obviously are concerns anytime your, your client confesses to a crime, especially a, a very serious crime. Um, there's even further uh, concerns when your client confesses to a very serious crime to an undercover operator. On top of the, um, the 
obvious problem being that uh, there's a confession that you have to deal with in front of a jury and, and uh, confessions are very powerful evidence. Uh, there is the issue is with respect to how the operation itself is conducted. Um, I'm a defense lawyer, so I, I do have a, a biased view of this, but um, as you've already heard, this technique is often used uh, only in the most serious of uh, offenses that are being investigated. Generally speaking, uh, it's predominantly murders that are being investigated when this technique is used. Um, and when these techniques are being used, it's, it's often because uh, not only is the uh, suspect a suspect to the police, uh, but they may very well be a suspect within the community. And uh, for instance, Mr. Hart, who was the uh, the applicant in the, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada decision, was accused of murdering his uh, three-year-old twin girls. So obviously a very significant uh, offense. Uh, and with respect to my former client, Mr. Buckley, who I'll talk about a little more uh, further on in this, in this talk, uh, he was accused of murdering his own mother. Uh, these two individuals were not only suspects to the police, but they were uh, suspected by various members of the community, which had the effect of isolating them socially, not only from um, various uh, friends and family, uh, but from employers and so on and so forth within their community. <clears throat> and as these individuals become more alienated, this is a vulnerability that the police are able to um, successfully exploit. So, for instance, in both of the Hurt, uh, Mr. Big investigation and uh, Mr. Buckley's um, investigation as well, the police targeted both their loneliness um, with respect to friends in the community and supports, as well as uh, their uh, financial um, vulnerabilities. So the, the police are very well aware of, of who their targets are prior to the operation ever taking place. Uh, oftentimes targets are subjected to uh, surveillance for a period of time, uh, profiles are prepared, and it's determined how best uh, to approach these individuals. Um, over the course of, of the investigation, targets often uh, are introduced to various um, members of the criminal organization all of course are, are police officers and uh, they are introduced to what's often referred to as a family, um, close friends, uh, a support structure that uh, they do enjoy. They enjoy the camaraderie uh, of being around these, these other individuals. Um, and this becomes very important. Um, in addition, as I, as I mentioned, most of these uh, targets that, that I've researched were uh, financially vulnerable uh, with respect to Mr. Buckley, the, the individual I represented. Um, the police uh, approached him while he was uh, at the unemployment office collecting his check. They knew that he would be there on a specific date and provided him information on the job fair. Uh, that information was provided by an attractive young woman who they felt was uh, an individual they would have some success with. And then as Time progresses, not just Mr. Buckley, but many of these individuals, they're introduced to uh, a relatively lavish lifestyle. They are shown uh, the high life, essentially. They they're go to nice restaurants, they stay in nice hotels, they travel across the country. Uh, they're, they're shown uh, a, a lifestyle that, frankly, they would otherwise not have access to. Um, so they're provided not only with a sense of camaraderie and community, but they're provided with a sense of financial stability. And of course, uh, as Alina had previously mentioned, uh, once um, these targets feel very comfortable, uh, they are fully immersed in this organization, so to speak. Uh, they are asked to confess uh, to the crime that's being investigated. Um, the way that the approach is different in, in essentially every case, but uh, they're told that if they confess, they can continue to enjoy the high life. If not, uh, they will be forgotten or worse. So, as most people can see, the incentives for providing a confession, truthful or not, are quite high. And that's how they're designed. And these types of incentives are exactly what the principle of voluntariness and the confessions rule were created to prevent uh, when individuals who are known to be police officers, uh, if they were to provide these types of incentives uh, for a confession, 
uh, they wouldn't get very far. But because these officers are posing as organized crime members, the same rules don't apply. If all of that is not enough to, to create some concerns uh, surrounding the use of the Mr. Big technique, think of this. Should your client wish to testify at trial that they provided a false confession, they would be doing so in front of a jury, and they no doubt will have to answer questions about the surrounding circumstances involving their confession. And in doing so, they would have to readily admit that not only were they prepared to enter into a criminal organization and uh, commit various crimes at the behest of that criminal organization, that they wish they would also have to testify that they wish to remain uh, within that criminal organization so badly that they were prepared to confess to things they did not do in order to remain, remain a member of a criminal organization. Obviously that paints your client in a fairly poor light uh, as the uh, investigation is, is unfolding. Oftentimes these individuals are asked to participate in what they believe are crimes, uh, fake crimes or stage crimes, but what they believe are crimes. And these instances would provide a, a Crown prosecutor a significant amount of ammunition for cross-examination. So once your client has testified that he wanted to be a member of a criminal organization and concedes that he committed various crimes in order to uh, ingratiate himself with uh, gangsters or organized criminals, uh, it's very likely that the jury will find that your client is the type of person who is capable of committing very serious criminal acts. Um, obviously, that creates a bias within, uh, could create a bias with uh, various jurors, and it's also very, very concerning. And these concerns culminated in 2014 when uh, the Supreme Court of Canada heard Hart and uh, had to make a decision with respect to how or if uh, these types of Mr. Big operations uh, would be able to continue. Uh, essentially, the court had three choices. One, they could allow the police to continue um, operating Mr. Big techniques without any real constraints. Uh, secondly, they could prevent the use of evidence uh, that is obtained through a Mr. Big operation. Or third, they could uh, place some limitations on a Mr. Big operation and uh, provide guidance to the court on whether or not to accept evidence, which is obtained during the course of a um, Mr. Big sting. Um, and as, um, as we've heard, the court decided to uh, offer the third option, which was uh, providing some guidance uh, with respect to how this evidence and how these uh, techniques are to be are to be used. And what essentially, um, or, or what the, the outcome was, was that the court adopted a, a two-pronged analysis with respect to uh, how uh, Mr. Big operations were to be viewed by the court. And at paragraphs 85 and 86 of the decision, Justice Mulday, and I'll quote again, uh, states as follows. The first prong recognizes a new common law rule of evidence for assessing the admissibility of these confessions. The rule operates as follows. Where the state recruits an accused into a fictitious criminal organization of its own making and seeks to elicit a confession from him, any confession made by the accused to the state during the operation should be treated as presumptively inadmissible. The presumption of inadmissibility is overcome where the Crown can establish on a balance of probabilities that the probative value of the confession outweighs its prejudicial effect. In this context, the confession's probative value turns on an assessment of its reliability. Its prejudicial effect flows from the bad character evidence that must be admitted in order to put the operation and its confession in context. If the Crown is unable to demonstrate the accused confession is admissible, the rest of the evidence surrounding the Mr. Big operation becomes irrelevant and thus inadmissible. This rule, like the confessions rule, in this case, of, in the case of a conventional police interrogation, operates as a specific qualification to the party admissions exception to the hearsay rule. As regard the second prong, I would rely on the doctrine of abusive process to deal with the problem of police misconduct. I recognize that the doctrine has thus far provided less than effective, has proved less than effective in this context. While the problem is not an easy one, I propose to provide some guidance 
on how to determine if a Mr. Big operation crosses the line from skillful police work to an abusive process. Now, with respect to the uh, first prong, that of reliability, there's some fairly clear guidance. With respect to the concept of abusive process, the analysis is, I would suggest, is far less clear. At paragraph 115, Justice Muldaver states, Mr. Big operations are designed to induce confessions. The mere presence of inducements is not problematic. But police conduct, including inducements and threats, becomes problematic in the context when it approximates coercion. In conducting these operations, the police cannot be permitted to overcome the will of the accused and coerce a confession. This would almost certainly amount to an abusive process. So the question is, where does, where does that leave us? And as uh, you've heard, and, and I have not checked uh, Adelina's numbers, I'm sure that they're correct, is that uh, for the most part, these operations are still being conducted. Uh, and from what I gather is that the evidence is still being admitted uh, before courts. So while there has been some guidance with respect to how to uh, analyze these, these confessions and this guidance is, is for lower courts and trial courts. Um, the, the other effect is that it, it's allowed the police to ensure that uh, operations that they conduct are more likely to obtain admissible evidence. Um, and uh, I'll provide an example, and that is, as I mentioned, a client of mine uh, by the name of John Buckley, uh, the, uh, the decisions involving Mr. Buckley are uh, currently available. They are reported decisions. I, I represented Mr. Buckley in both 2013 and 2018 um, with respect to the same matter. Uh, in 2012, uh, Ms. Victoria Bronze Buckley was found deceased in her home. She had been living there with her son, John, uh, Mr. Buckley. On the night of March 1st, 2012, uh, he left uh, the family home in a snowstorm. Uh, to go and buy a pack of cigarettes. He was captured on closed circuit uh, cameras uh, throughout uh, his town uh, and, and did in fact go and buy a pack of cigarettes. When he returned, uh, he found his mother in a pool of blood on the floor. Uh, he determined very quickly that, that she was in fact deceased uh, and according to him, freaked out and didn't know what to do. Uh, he sat in another room in the house for hours uh, and waited until dawn at which time he walked a number of kilometers to his sister's home, uh, woke her and advised that their mother uh, was in fact dead. The police were called and they found that Ms. Browns Buckley had been bludgeoned to death by an unknown object. Uh, the murder weapon was never found. An autopsy was conducted and it was found that uh, she had been struck approximately eight times, at least eight times by an item uh, while unknown was consistent with a hammer. Uh, Mr. Buckley was about two weeks after arrested and charged uh, with the murder of his mother. Uh, frankly, there was very little evidence uh, to support the allegation that uh, he was in fact involved. Um, a preliminary inquiry was scheduled for December of that year and very shortly before that preliminary inquiry, uh, the Crown withdrew the charges against Mr. Buckley and he had been released. Uh, that being said, during the time that he was in custody awaiting his preliminary inquiry, he had been provided copy of all of the evidence uh, that the Crown had in its file, which include crime scene photos, uh, autopsy reports, uh, forensic reports, uh, statements, and so on and so forth. Upon his release, um, he was uh, essentially an outcast in his community. People treated him as though he were a murderer and that he killed his mother. Uh, eventually, he, he moved around a, a little bit and settled in Montreal, uh, where he began to work in a number of low paying jobs. In October of 2015, the police uh, decided that they would uh, reinvestigate what they considered this to be a, a cold case and that uh, they would prepare a, a Mr. Big uh, investigation for Mr. Buckley. Uh, he was the subject of surveillance for a significant period of time. And uh, in October of 2015, they, as I mentioned previously, approached him at the uh, uh, unemployment office. He was there to pick up his uh, unemployment or EI check, his employment insurance check, and uh, was approached by an attractive uh, undercover police officer who provided him with a flyer uh, for something that similar to a job fair. Uh, they indicated that they had been quite successful in the past at, at getting jobs for individuals who uh, were in need of employment. <laughs> uh, Mr. Buckley did attend for that interview and was placed with a company 
uh, working out of a warehouse. Uh, he started at a at a rate of $20 an hour, which at that point in Mr. Buckley's life was the most he had ever made. I, I should point out Mr. Buckley wasn't quite a young man at the time. Uh, he worked in a warehouse for a number of weeks, and as time went on, he was asked to assist in, in deliveries of various products. Um, while he was making these deliveries, it was implied that uh, the company he was working for was also part of a criminal organization. For the most part, throughout the course of this operation, which did last a period of six months, Mr. Buckley was uh, spending most of his time with uh, one particular operator, whose uh, name is subject to a publication ban, uh, but he spent approximately 700 hours with that individual over the course of six months. Um, and during that time, Mr. Buckley was treated to travel across Canada. He stayed in hotels, he ate at nice restaurants, uh, he was uh, taken to nightclubs, was exposed to large amounts of cash, hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash at a time sometimes, uh, was uh, entrusted with uh, amounts of bulk gold, um, was treated to experience such as uh, attending a Montreal Canadiens game, was provided with a, a game jersey. All of these things are, are things that Mr. Buckley never would have been able to experience uh, but for his recruitment into the criminal organization. As time went on, he was asked to participate in a number of uh, feigned criminal uh, enterprises, although that was unknown to him. Uh, examples of these were the theft of a uh, laptop from an RCMP uh, undercover car and uh, a staged interrogation and borderline kidnapping of an, of an RCMP officer. Uh, as the um, investigation came to its, its apex, he was told uh, by the boss that uh, some information had come to light about Mr. Buckley's problems in Nova Scotia involving the death of his mother. Uh, the boss told him that his, his uh, information was that the RCMP had reinvestigated the case and that Mr. Buckley was soon going to be rearrested and charged with the murder of his mother. Uh, the boss came up with a solution and that was that uh, there was an individual in a Quebec jail who owed the organization a significant amount of money, who was prepared to falsely confess to the death of Mr. Buckley's mother. The only way this was going to work, of course, is that if Mr. Buckley provided all of the details uh, in regards to the killing of his mother, so the fall guy would know the details and get them right in his confession. Mr. Buckley was sat down for an interview and uh, was told that the organization knew he was involved, they needed him to confess, and they needed to provide all of the details. Mr. Buckley denied his involvement. He was told time and time again that if he did not confess, the organization could not help him. He would also be ejected from the organization and they would have to turn his back, their backs on him as he would create too much heat on the organization and uh, police oversight. If he confessed, however, he would no longer have to worry about the police investigating him in Nova Scotia. He could continue to advance through the ranks of the criminal organization and enjoy the the uh, lifestyle of that provided. Mr. Buckley told Mr. Big that he knew all of the details of his mother's murder as he had been provided a copy of the police file years earlier. He indicated that he was the one who found the body and lived in the home, so there was very little that could possibly be known that he didn't already know and once again asserted his innocence. Once again, Mr. Big indicated that uh, that was not acceptable. Mr. Buckley had to confess to the events and provide detailed explanation as to what occurred. Eventually, Mr. Buckley did confess. He said that he struck his mother three times with a hammer in order to collect her insurance. money. Shortly thereafter, he was returned to Nova Scotia, arrested and charged. This, of course, was years after the Hart decision. The police were very well aware of, of Hart and its implications. And as you can see, very little difference in the way the operation was conducted. In this particular case, Mr. Buckley did not provide any information that would not have been known to him uh, or myself for that matter. Um, Mr. Buckley did provide a statement to the police after his arrest. A voir dire was held in relation to Mr. Buckley uh, after a number of, I believe it was weeks of evidence, uh, the court found that the confession was not of such a reliable nature that its probative value outweighed its prejudicial effect and it was excluded as evidence uh, and Mr. Buckley's charges were then dismissed. So in this case, Mr. Buckley did benefit from the analysis in Hart. 
uh, it would have been very difficult to challenge the confession prior to the Hart decision. That being said, he was exposed to the technique itself uh, and was held in custody for a significant period of time prior to being released. Granted, the police did not feign any significant violence or threaten him in any way. Uh, at trial, officers indicated that post Hart, they had been directed not to do so. Uh, they had been told to use less violence uh, and less overt threats and use uh, more psychological uh, interference. They were also told to collect confirmatory evidence when possible to improve upon the reliability of any confessions. These are good things and they can certainly go to level the playing field to some degree, uh, but the Supreme Court of Canada's decision has not put a halt to the exploitation of accused people or their vulnerabilities at the hands of the police. Furthermore, one undercover operator candidly told uh, the court on cross-examination that uh, his group was focusing on shortening the length of their operations and relying less on the organization aspect of the Mr. Big operations as to circumvent the definition of Mr. Big, therefore possibly avoiding the onus imposed upon the Crown. It is also important to keep in mind that uh, post Hart, while the onus is on the Crown to establish the reliability of a uh, confession, uh, should an accused wish to challenge the manner in which the operation was conducted by way of an abusive process, that onus still lies upon the accused and his counsel, his or her counsel. Um, this may require an accused to testify prior to uh, the trial proper in his own defense and be subject to cross-examination. This can be an issue and it's something that uh, people should keep in mind should they wish to challenge an operation based on abusive process. Uh, the issue of abusive process came up in another matter which I was involved in, it was uh, Queen versus Derbyshire. Um, this was not found to be a Mr. Big operation but was an undercover operation uh, where members of the RCMP posed as members of organized crime. Uh, Ms. Derbyshire was thought to have some information regarding the uh, whereabouts of a suspected uh, murderer. Uh, the RCMP investigated her at length uh, and listened to uh, her phone via intercepts. Uh, they were unable to, to uh, receive any useful information um, through those um, avenues. So the police crafted an undercover plan that involved approaching Ms. Derbyshire. Uh, they parked outside of her apartment building, entered her underground parking garage when she came home one afternoon um, she was by herself in her car in a dark, poorly lit underground uh, parking garage. As she exited her vehicle, two large men dressed as uh, what she described as high-end gangsters approached her, demanded that she get back in her vehicle. One of the two officers uh, entered the vehicle on the passenger side while the other blocked her exit on the driver's side. Uh, she was told that they were here from Montreal uh, because the murder that had taken place had affected their business and they were not very happy. They needed to know what, if anything, she knew. And uh, she was told that uh, they meant business. It was conceded on the stand that they had spoke to her in a very direct uh, and threatening manner, if not actually threatening her. Uh, she very quickly told the police what she knew. She said that she was involved in, in disposing of the, of the murder weapon as well as some evidence. They asked her where the murder weapon was and she indicated that uh, the murder weapon was thrown in a river in Moncton. Uh, very shortly after that, the police told her that she was going to cancel everything she had in her schedule that day and accompany them to Moncton. She was placed in the back of a SUV with tinted windows. Uh, the police took control of her phone and drove her to Moncton where she described uh, where the firearm was found. Uh, she also showed them a, a burn site where some evidence had been destroyed after the homicide. Uh, upon returning home, the police dropped her off, and uh, after discovering all the evidence that she pointed out, she was arrested and charged with accessory after the fact to murder. This was not a, a lengthy investigation. Uh, Ms. Derbyshire was not being recruited in any way, shape, or form, um, but most people can see that there are some parallels uh, with respect to this and a Mr. Big investigation. Uh, this occurred prior to 2014, and uh, after the voir dire for Ms. Derbyshire 
had adjourned for decision, the heart decision was released. Uh, I certainly tried to apply the uh, two-pronged analysis from Hart uh, to Mr. Derbyshire's situation. Uh, and while the court found that the first prong of the of the Hart approach was not applicable to Mr. Derbyshire, uh, they did rely upon the abuse of process uh, second prong of the Hart analysis in excluding her evidence. They found that uh, she had essentially been threatened and that her statements to the police were in fact coerced. <clears throat> The evidence was excluded, the charges against her were dismissed, and that was upheld by our Court of Appeal, and the application for leave by the Crown was dismissed by the Supreme Court of Canada. So while the release uh, of Hart has made Mr. Big operations somewhat more reliable um, and somewhat less coercive, coercive in nature, it certainly has not prevented uh, the use of Mr. Big operations by the police. Um, and at this point in time, it's very difficult to say how often the police are using these operations as uh, we only ever hear about the ones which are successful in obtaining uh, confessions. So it's very difficult uh, to ascertain how often these operations are successful and how often they are not. Subject to any questions that uh, everyone has, those are the comments that I have. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, it's I, I knew both of those cases and still it because it's fascinating when uh, when I hear the uh, details of the operations. Um, we do have um, one question in the comments. I have some questions as well and I do want to encourage uh, people to uh, to use the Q and a box and uh, and type their questions there. Um, so the first question uh, see here. Um, it seems that the psychological interference, as you put it, is as bad, if not worse, for manipulating people into confessions. Is there any room in such cases to bring in an expert witness, such as forensic psychologists, to speak to this to the court? Yeah, I think that would that would certainly be possible under the second branch of the, of the heart analysis to establish that there was, a, a, in fact, an abuse and that the psychological the psychological coercion is a tantamount to a physical threats. Uh, so I think that would be possible in the in the in the right circumstances. In Hart, that was uh, done to some degree. Uh, experts were brought in to uh, establish that that he was socially isolated and was uh, certainly prone uh, to police coercion. Um, okay, another question here. Um, where where this uh, uh, this uh, audience member is in Australia? Has Mr. Uh, Australia also has uh, Mr. Big's things. However, our courts are extremely resistant to reforming Mr. Big. What can be done? Sorry, I missed part of that question. I, could you repeat so, that? In Australia, there are Mr. Big's things in Australia as well. However, they do not have any kind of comparable framework as, as heart, right? Um, so um, this person asked, what can be done? Uh, how can they, uh, I, I would imagine, how can it be a challenge, how can it be reformed without any um, in intervention from courts? Yeah, I, I, without any intervention from courts, I, I think it's it's nearly impossible uh, without any some type of, of legislative reform or um, judicial reform. I mean, the police have a significant amount of resources. I'm not familiar with the Australian Charter and what, what their rights are precisely and what their rules of evidence are. But it certainly proved very, very difficult here in Canada, and a lot of lawyers tried uh, to attack Mr. Big uh, operations, and all but one were unsuccessful in doing so. Um, we have another question here that asks, um, if you think there is a better way to investigate these kinds of cases than pretending to be a criminal organization, I think so. Um, let me let me rephrase this. Um, uh, you know, in, in a manner that coincides to what I was thinking. Um, so I think a lot of times the explanation that we get for um, or why Canada is so attached to this organization is that generally these, um, these are launched for very serious cases like murder, right? Um, where there are absolutely no, you're not gonna see this for a simple assault, right? Um, and uh, they are very, very serious, uh, serious cases where there isn't uh, um, a lot of evidence, but uh, the, the police has a very strong suspicion as to who they think the, the accused is. So 
I think the question would be, you know, what would you say to that? The police would say, you know, this is our last resort. We do not have another way of investigating this. That means we will let, you know, the killer walk. And, and what kind of justice is that? So I think, I think this is the argument that they are raising. And that and the fact that they are very effective in that, uh, in that uh, they do result in confessions and uh, then if they result in confession, they result in convictions. So yeah, I, I would think that we could think of that question this way. Yeah, I, I mean, they, they do result in confessions and uh, post heart, those confessions are, are going to be even more uh, reliable and juries are going to put a lot more weight in those confessions. So if, if you look at Ms. Derbyshire, for instance, she confessed and she provided physical evidence that nobody else would have been able to find. So, um, you know, there, there has to be some balance, I would suggest. Uh, we don't allow the police to do just anything they want to because it may, it may close cases. Um, many jurisdictions do not allow this type of operation at all because they recognize that uh, it, it's, it's, it's just ripe for police misconduct. Uh, the police are, are very well funded and uh, they are very well trained and it's, it's a very uh, unlevel playing field. Um, so it, when you look at, at who these operations target, uh, they're generally not the upper end criminals, so to speak. These aren't high level individuals. Uh, these are people who, who have vulnerabilities and those vulnerabilities are being exploited by the state. So I, I would like to see the use of the technique um, prevented almost in its entirety. Um, that being said, that the general public like to see people convicted of the crimes that they believe they, they committed. So, um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that per se. I would like to see it, it, uh, it prevented. I don't think that's going to happen uh, every time uh, somebody's convicted of a murder that, that uh, appears to be reliable uh, in a strong conviction that the public's quite happy with that. So there, there's not much reason uh, for elected officials who appoint uh, most judicial appointments uh, to to really make any waves. That's a great point, and and it reminds me of uh, of uh, a comment that my my colleague uh, Professor Archie Kaiser made when he said, you know, um, when uh, when an operation when catching a killer requires the uh, violation of so many rules and so many. Uh, the principles and so many values, perhaps it's better not to catch them at all. Um, because, uh, because ultimately, as you said, we are talking here about uh, not only about uh, a very significant uh, uh, concerns regarding reliability and regarding the fact that people do confess and do wrong, confess wrongly, but also ultimately we're talking about extremely abusive police tactic, tactics and exploitation of the most marginalized individuals. Um, in the and as you noted and in the study that um, I conducted um, also uh, I think it was uh, a significant number it was over 60 percent of, of the people that had an intersection of mental disorders disabilities um, and uh, and other addictions generally addictions all those things on top of most of them, if not all of them, had very significant financial, they were destitute, they had a history and unemployment and very low IQ. So there was an overlapping of intersecting issues that the police was targeting. So the thing is that police doesn't really use this operation to catch any criminal or to catch, um, to solve crimes and um, they're worried about the victims because it seems that in these situations, the victim of smarter criminals will not get justice. Anyway, right? Because they wouldn't be uh, this. This tactic would not work. Um, rather, this tactic is really very strongly rooted in uh, um, in exploiting uh, disabilities and uh, in exploiting uh, significant uh, um, uh, issues that the targets are having, and which outside of this context we would never allow, right? Or we would be appalled to hear about. Um, so somebody is asking, um, in Buckley, I believe the accused was quite young, but legally an adult. Do you know if these operations happen to young people as well? So people who would be under uh, uh, the Youth Act? I don't know. Uh, it, I suspect that they would not be. Uh, the, the reason for that is that these operations are very, very expensive. Um, and the, the end result would, would not produce what the public, I think, would expect. So 
Uh, oftentimes, young people who are charged with murder are charged as young people. Uh, their sentences are, are far, far shorter than, than what an adult would expect. Uh, also, the, the rules surrounding confessions by a young person are, are very different than an, an adult. Uh, so I suspect that if this technique were to be used uh, on a young person, and I'm not familiar with a case where it has been, uh, that it, it may be somebody very close to the, the age of adulthood. Right. I think that the youngest that uh, I've seen was uh, somebody who was 18. Um, there were a couple in since 2014, there were a couple of people who were 18 um, at the time of the um, at the time of the um, of the undercover operation. Um, they were fairly brutal and it's very interesting because Hart does very specifically say that the young age of, uh, of the target should be considered against uh, admitting the evidence because of their immaturity level, because they are more uh, easy to be influenced and manipulated. And yet in, uh, in uh, the cases that I reviewed, um, uh, the, the, the confession was admitted, even though in one of them, uh, not only he was 18, but he actually fell in love with the operator and they, uh, he was hoping into having a love affair with the operator. But um, uh, that didn't seem to convince the court that there may be a reliability issue with that confession. Um, another question, uh, which I think you would have uh, sort of uh, uh, answered uh, or we would have answered is whether um, there are any patterns with what kind of people police are targeting with Mr. Big Stings and do they exploit their targets uh, uh, target with uh, weaknesses? We sort of touched upon that. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I haven't seen a, a target witness per se. Ms. Derbyshire would be the closest thing to a target witness. Uh, there was actually a very interesting article, or I'm sorry, a, a matter before the court uh, here in Halifax. The individual they were looking for was arrested and charged with murder uh, numerous years later, uh, and the Crown had called Mr. Berkshire to testify against uh, that individual. It was interesting because uh, the that person's defense lawyer argued that evidence obtained from a witness um, from an abuse should not be admissible not only against that witness, but against anybody who that witness may testify against. That argument was unsuccessful, um, but it certainly does leave the door open for the police to use coercion against witnesses rather than accused in order to force them to testify in matters that they don't want to testify to. Well, for those witnesses, that's actually the RV Bradshaw. Uh, well, it, it, it could be, that case, particular case is not RV Bradshaw, but. Um, whether or not, the, it certainly leaves the door open if the witness is called to the stand. And Ms. Derbyshire had to testify in her own defense uh, at the voir dire to, to testify about her fear of the undercover operators. So the Crown had a document that, uh, that uh, they could cross-examine her on uh, about her knowledge uh, of the murder and the, the murder weapon. Um, she did not want to be involved. Uh, she was fearful of pretty much everyone involved. Um, and the court found that even though uh, the information obtained by the Crown was only obtained through an abusive process, that it would be admissible in another person's trial. Mm -hmm. I think Derbyshire was a little different also because there was so much violence involved, very overt violence involved. So uh, probably the uh, vulnerability of the target would have been uh, less relevant uh, at the moment where basically she's uh, threatened uh, with being beaten up. Um, but I think the other weaknesses would probably matter in their decision of, uh, of uh, targeting individuals, whether witnesses or, uh, or um, otherwise. Um, somebody's asking, um, do you think a revamp of the confessions rule more generally uh, would be necessary to further curtail Mr. Big operations? Is that realistic? I don't see the confessions rule changing anytime soon. Uh, it, there has been some very minor modifications at, at appellate court levels uh, with respect to voluntariness. Uh, that being said, it's it's very difficult uh, because if, if they were to change it in a way uh, that allowed the defense to argue that undercover operators were in fact a person's in authority, then all undercover operations of every stripe would be prohibited under the confessions rule. Uh, so I'm sure there could be some some uh, tinkering that could be done, um, but I don't see it happening. 
Um, we have a couple more minutes, uh, and if somebody wants to ask more questions, uh, feel free to type. Otherwise, I'm, I'm just going to ask you this. Um, and I think it sort of came out of the discussion, but I would, I would be really interested in your opinion on, on this issue. Um, there is, well, a lot of people, you know, and perhaps from other jurisdictions consider that heart is, is, is progressive because it has imposed some limitation. You yourself have said that. Um, it has led to being using less overt violence and less threat, which of course it is not bad. Um, so it might have led to a change in the way the undercover operations are are uh, are going. Um, so it might seem like a good step. Uh, it is an exclusionary rule now, as you said. It has uh, changed the burden. The burden is now on the crown, at least for the reliability stage. To what extent, however, um, the cynic in me is asking, has Hart in fact led to legitimizing these operations and providing them a foundation and a strength that before that they perhaps didn't have because there was always, um, you know, knowing that they are, they are just um, uh, managing to exist because of the loop loopholes in the legislation. Now we have a legislation that basically says you're legitimate. It's just that we're going to have to uh, apply a framework whenever you try to bring the confession such a thing. Well, I, I don't know if it was ever legitimate per se. I, I don't think any court felt that uh, Mr. Big was illegitimate. I mean, they time and time again allowed these confessions in despite some very appalling circumstances. Uh, Mr. Buckley is, is, is the PG version of Mr. Big, if, if I can say that, compared to some of the things that took place before 2014. And prior to Hart, those individuals, those confessions went in, those individuals were convicted. Um, so I, while it, I, I, I see what you're saying, I'm certainly happy that the Supreme Court of Canada decided to do something. I mean, it was certainly open to them to do nothing and, and leave the, the, the situation the way it was. Um, but I feel it was always been legitimized. Uh, the public is happy to have crime solved, and uh, <laughs> there's no groundswell from from anyone other than potentially defense lawyers and, and uh, individuals involved uh, with civil liberties to, to that are really opposed to this. Um, most members of the public are very happy to have bad guys off the street. Um, so I, I think it's always been legitimate. I think it's been curtailed to a limited degree, which mm -hmm. I'm happy with, but I think the court could have done more. Right. And, and I, I mean, I take your point, you know, in, re, in relationship to Mr. Buckley, as you were saying, you know, probably these, uh, he, his confession would not have been thrown out, right? Uh, his confession would have probably gone in without the hard framework. And yet, unfortunately, it does seem that at least, uh, 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 you know, Mr. Buckley seems to be more of an exception. And I'm not really sure. Um, uh, what it was about it. There were definitely comparable cases where the evidence was not thrown out, especially uh, in some of the prairies jurisdictions, which is quite interesting. So it does seem that overall Hart had a pretty negligible impact actually in terms of, of, of these operations, which is, um, which is surprising and unfortunate. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not convinced on, on, uh, on the long-term, um, impact that it will continue to have on the, these operations. Perhaps we'll see more in the years to come. Eventually, so, eventually everyone will know about it and it will be less useful at that point in time. I think we're all, <laughs> all waiting for that to happen, for everybody to read in the newspapers about that, right? But as, as you and I were talking before this talk, we all think that this will never happen to us, right? And we would be able to see it coming. Um, so perhaps it's not always so so true. Um, so somebody asked if there are um, are juries given any kind of warning about evidence from Mr. Big operations, especially given how much weight these confessions carry. So in the situation where they haven't been thrown out, I've never had a Mr. Big confession get to a jury. But um, <laughs> that uh, that being said, I, I would certainly be asking for some type of instruction. Uh, there are instructions given to juries about. Um, confessions in any event, uh, in that juries are not to put all of their eggs in that one basket. Uh, I think it would certainly be uh, determined by the, the, the facts of a particular case. For instance, if an accused took the stand and explained why he confessed, you know, 
falsely, uh, most judges would, would provide some type of a limiting instruction with respect to how uh, members of the jury were to weigh that evidence. But that being said, instructions from a judge, you know, confessions are, are very, very powerful evidence. Um, and as you said, especially in the context, let us not forget, this is just not just the confession in which the guy sits next to the police officer and says, yes, I've done it. These are in the context in which this individual, there is a lot of evidence of how he seemingly voluntarily joined the criminal organization and committed a lot of, um, seemed to be involved in sketchy activity, which of course is bad character evidence, but it's allowed because it's in the context of the um, the operation. So it's not just the confession, but it's the confession and the background of this guy that clearly makes such a strong impact on, on a jury with or without any kind of uh, warning. Well, um, so, in po yeah. post heart, if I can if I just inter interrupt for a second, the, the confessions are actually going to be much more powerful because the judge has already made a determination that they're reliable confessions. Um, so there's going to be an issue of reliability, which is also going to be left with the jury. Uh, so while a judge would likely ask a jury to uh, examine whether or not there are any uh, confirmatory uh, points of evidence, it's really already been determined by the judge that there are and that this is a reliable confession. So I suspect that it would be much more difficult uh, to argue that this is a false confession post heart than it would have been pre heart that going back to my initial question. <laughs> um, so somebody says, uh, can you talk more about the, uh, about the public and how much does the public actually know about this practice? Well, I, I mean, I watch TV <laughs> and I read magazines. So, uh, you know, and even in the newspapers, I, I guess it depends what individual member of the public is interested in. Um, I know I've had, you know, friends and family and, and people who've asked me about it, uh, not in the context of my knowledge, but just generally because they've read about it and they found it interesting. So. Um, it's out there. It's uh, it's not a secret. I, and I mean, I, I think that people know about them, but they are always, it's also how the information is presented. Um, they, I mean, I remember reading about Buckley in excruciating detail, but that's because Mr. Buckley was, a, uh, his confession was thrown out, he was released, and he had the opportunity to go and give uh, an extremely detailed account of mm -hmm. um, of, uh, of what has happened to the press, right? But I think, and, and, and as you said, Buckley is actually not the worst of those cases by uh, comparing to not some other. No. So uh, unfortunately, in some of the worst scenarios, the targets did not get the chance to explain their side and to, to, to give this kind of detail. So I think that there may be some information out there, but I take, I take our um, commenters point that, you know, I don't think the public actually knows a lot of details about what, what goes on sometimes. And when they do, they're always qualified by the horrific crime that the target has allegedly done, which is probably, um, you know, it's making it hard to be sympathetic, right, to, yeah. to, to the situation. So, um, no, that's true. And uh, so, uh, so there, there is more information than there was five years ago. I think that's Absolutely. probably correct. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna have to to stop here. We probably, be, I would at least I would be able to talk about this all evening, but um, uh, we'll have to stop here. I really appreciate uh, your time and your expertise, Pat. Uh, this has been a really uh, interesting talk, and um, uh, the the video has been recording and is going to be available on the YouTube channel of uh, Schulich School of Law. So. Uh, um, we are thrilled to have had you here. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.